Uh, I'm just, greetings everyone. <laughs> the recording just started. So greetings everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael and I'm a last year medical student and a clinical problem server team member. Welcome back to this incredible discussion that we're about to happen with Dr. Zavin and Dr. Staff. And I just wanted to have a quick word to describe our, um, this project that we are launching within CP Silvers with a focus on international medical graduates and students as well. Every Saturday we have our global virtual morning report, but we're gonna have uh, special episodes with uh, programs that are interested in showcasing their programs, opening the qu uh, questions for the audience to present cases for us. So everyone is welcomed. This is a free and inclusive initiative. And also we're gonna have uh, other things as well. There's about to come a mock interview with me, uh, Ravi and Sakriti being interviewed by our dear friend, Dr. Ravi. And we just hope to see you guys there and hope to help a lot of people. And best of luck on these areas of location. Thanks, Rafa. What a cool program. And uh, congratulations to all of you who have just um, submitted. I know uh, programs are really excited to meet you guys in the future. So all the hard work that's gone into this point, you should feel really great about it. Welcome. Great to see everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hump day, as we say. Um, I will just share some brief reflections on yesterday's case, um, which uh, Rafael presented and Jack really discussed with the whole group. It was cool to see the model of the entire group signed on um, chatting through the case out loud. So I'm going to reflect um, by doing two things, sort of just briefly share what the case was in a problem representation, and then actually just tell you the diagnosis up front and um, build the illness script for that diagnosis um, based on the features of the case, because it turns out it was a pretty classic presentation of something that's quite rare. Um, so um, this was a case of a 48-year-old woman who came in with a two-month history of increased facial hair and acne, um, as well as a couple weeks of shortness of breath, who on her evaluation was found to have signs of virilization with some um, extra hair growth on her face. She also had a Cushingoid appearance to her face, new hypertension, hypokalemia to 2.2, and an exudative pleural effusion with a CT scan showing a very large seven by seven adrenal mass, some abdominal lymph nodes, um, ultimately found to have metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma. So I actually just wanna sort of tackle my reflections in reverse by starting with the diagnosis of adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, first of all, like I said in the beginning, it, it's very rare. Um, so we may not see it often in our careers, but the way this patient presented was fairly classic. Um, the most common manifestations of adrenal cortical carcinoma are two endocrinopathy syndromes, both excess um, androgen um, secreting hormone as well as excess uh, glucocorticoid. So representing both virilization as well as Cushing features um, with which this individual had. Um, the size of the mass itself being seven by seven centimeters was one of a few criteria that actually I think Kirtan showed us through one of Tiago's um, diagnostic schemas of how to tell if an adrenal mass is malignant or not. And in this case, the sheer size favored it, um, as well as the Hounsfield units, which we didn't have specifically from the CT scan, but that can give you the balance of sort of fibrosis versus, uh, versus like liquid or water in the tumor and um, favor that being malignant versus benign. And then of course the um, levels of excess endocrine hormones in the blood also can tell you that it's um, a secreting uh, adrenal mass. So in this case, um, just a pretty classic presentation of these features, Cushing's as well as realization um, with, I wanna highlight a few other things of the illness script for adrenal cortical carcinoma, pretty rapid onset. So over just a couple months, um, with um, pretty aggressive behavior of the tumor. So this woman, unfortunately, when she presented, already had metastatic disease involving her lymph nodes um, as well as her lung. Um, the final sort of comment I wanna make besides sort of her, her symptom pattern, the quick time course, as well as kind of the metastatic involvement at time of um, 
time of diagnosis is uh, we talked a little bit about just how common it is to find an adrenal tumor in general. Most are not functional in terms of having endocrine action, um, but the minority is not such a small minority that does. It's about 15 to 20% of adrenal tumors are functional. Uh, functional doesn't mean they're malignant, but it means they do have um, hormone action. Um, and that 15 to 20% is a common enough number that anytime we see someone who has an incidental asymptomatic adrenal mass, it is appropriate to check um, the hormone axes associated, specifically looking for um, catecholamine as well as aldosterone and cortisol excess, uh, because often you'll find at, at least it may even be subclinical, but functional uh, hormone activity of uh, even incidental adrenal tumors. So just a good reminder, these pop up all the time in imaging that we get. And, and by the guidelines, we actually should be testing the hormone axes to see if even for a small tumor, there is some functional activity with it. Um, I think I'll just stop there, but it, it ended up being a fairly classic case of this rare condition of metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, unfortunately, a sad outcome for the patient who really opted for palliation given this kind of quick development of her diagnosis. Um, but it was just a fantastic discussion that took us through approaches to adrenal masses, pleural fusions, um, excess virilization in, in someone. Um, it was just a one, wonderful group discussion and I really learned a lot from it. Yes, Steph, do you mind if I just add one point? Please. Yes, so I, actually yesterday from Thiago's infographic and from Jack's switching, I learned one important part that there are many possible causes of histotism and acne, but when you get some classic signs of realization, so as per the case reports and as per the studies, the two signs, so one of them is deepening of the voice and another one of them being clitoromegaly. So if you have these two things, then you are almost assured of the fact that either you are dealing with ovarian malignancy or you are dealing with adrenal malignancy. So we don't have to worry about, you know, ectopic Cushing syndrome. So like, say, let's say small cell lung cancer secreting ACTS or probably carcinoid tumor secreting ACTS because they won't cause these things. If you have deepening of voice and titromegaly, then either it's ovarian or adrenal. That's it. So that was one of the parts which I learned. And that is, you know, so significant because so many symptoms, but just two answers for that. So that is really cool. Thank you, Kirtan. Great teaching point. So Steph, um, um, Kirtan has a case to present, which is uh, very exciting. And uh, Valeria would like to discuss the case. So um, we'll just wait um, 10 more seconds for anyone to, um, to, to ask to join Valeria in the discussion. And if not, we'll just jump in and we can just um, have people you know, opine either by voice or in a chat and kind of um, uh, try to have a bit more of a, um, democratic isn't the right word, but, but diffuse participation uh, among everybody just to, to try to engage as many people as possible. So um, last call, anyone, anyone wanna be in the driving, driver's, driver's seat with Valeria? Going once. Going twice. Okay, that's okay. Next time. Um, so um, let's let's go ahead and get into it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Priyo is gonna is gonna help in the chat. Uh, Rafael, do you wanna co, co discuss with Valeria? Sure. Beautiful. Okay. Um, Let's do it. I think we all we all know each other um, at this point. Uh, I suspect so. Um, let's get going, Kirtan. Take us take us away. Sure. So the title for today's case is going to be hidden in plain sight. And now talking about the chief complaint. So the chief complaint is if you pain, and to give you a little bit of HPI, we have a fifty six year old lady presenting with two months of diffuse pain all over the body. The pain is of dull aching type and it versions with exertion, especially in the lower limbs and calf muscles. She also endorses is fatigue and malaise over the same time course. Activities of daily living are not affected and she indeed feels well after resting or having a nice nap. Increased hair fall since three months is one of her concerns. 
Apart from that, she denies any association of exacerbation or improvement of symptoms with particular time of the day. So it's just constant. And as for the review of system, the patient denies joint pain or stiffness, any weight loss, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, any sleep disturbances, any headaches or cognitive or memory issues, no anxiety, no depression, and no bowel or bladder disturbances. And that's the end of eloquent. You know what? I, I just had a thought of, I wondered if Kirtan was going to make us stop at the title to give our approach to hidden in plain sight. And <laughs> I was thinking, how would I, how would I tackle that? Because sometimes, as you guys know, these cases have kind of cool titles, um, but we got a little more information than that. So thank you. Um, Zavin, did you have a, an order in mind for people chatting? Uh, no. Cool. Um, Valeria, do you want to team up with me? And we could uh, hop in first for this first section. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I really, I'm not sure. I mean, I think uh, malaise or diffuse pain is something quite in a specific. I will say that um, this could be probably something systemic that is manifesting as a diffuse pain or fatigue. Um, I would like to know if this is actually if this has a motor component, because I mean, it has pain or some exertion. So I would think something um, rather not inflammatory because I think if it was like a rheumatoid type of presentation would probably get better with exertion and not um, on, uh, worse. So maybe um, I would like to know maybe the patient, what, what does she do? for a living, maybe it had something with that, or if there's something more systemic, she doesn't refer any weight loss. And the joint pain was something that I was hoping for as, as a clue, but maybe not. And I would think, I mean, diffuse pain, honestly, the first thing that comes on is fibromyalgia. Um, but I, I think that's a diagnosis of, um, the last diagnosis that we think of just to rule out other um, inflammatory conditions and systemic conditions as well. So. I'm really a little sister. Help me out here. Yeah, no, I, I love how you tackled it. Um, kind of thinking a little bit about anatomy as well as particular diagnoses that come to mind when we hear the symptom of pain everywhere, right? Because it's actually, I find it a lot harder to tackle that than pain in the knee, right? Pain in the fingers. It's 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 much more challenging. So I'm I feel very challenged also, Valerie. Yeah. I think um the way I would probably tackle this is to build on your um, approach of like, what, what does it take to move? And thus, what kind of parts of the body could be inflamed or painful for any reason? So if we think about just getting up and, and moving our bodies, uh, what does it take? It takes um, bones, joints, muscle, um, the kind of tendons and other connective tissues, um, it takes, uh, nerves and, uh, it takes kind of motiv motivation or, um, kind of, uh, desire to do that also. So sort of tackling that, I think kind of, uh, bony processes at play, right. Would be an important thing to think about, you know, diffuse joint pain. We're hearing in a very important negative review of systems. She really doesn't localize anything to the joints, but certainly anyone, for example, very common with just pretty diffuse osteoarthritis, right? It hurts most of the time moving around. Um, you brought up sort of fibromyalgia, which comes very much in sort of the myofascial um, segments of the body also. Certainly you can have sort of tendon inflammation with enthesitis that can be in multiple locations that could play into this. Um, muscle would open up the whole category of uh, myalgias versus myositis. Uh, leading to this. And then I think it's critical that um, Kirtan mentioned that this time she's not feeling additionally anxious or depression because uh, depressive, um, because certainly um, primary psychiatric conditions, right, could manifest in this way with systemic symptoms of fatigue and having really just pain everywhere. And then finally, neuropathic pain or really any kind of um, problem with all the nerves, right, connecting to moving those parts of the body really could be a play. So I mean, there are schemas for each of those individual sections, but I think the way that I am tackling this to begin with is um, thinking about what it takes to move, thinking of the anatomy of it, as well as the not forgetting the nervous system and the, our mental state as well as part of this. 
but then tying in already, we've got some very pertinent negative symptoms that Kirtan mentioned, right? It, it's not actually anything in the joints that we can tell doesn't seem to be mood related at this point, but it leaves us a pretty long list um, with I agree, Valerie, uh, sort of the, the fatigue uh, is really important. And I actually wonder if what we might be able to hang our hat on is the hair loss, right? That of all of these symptoms might be the most um, localizing at this time and brings up sort of whole category of endocrinopathies um, as well as kind of, you know, behavioral related things can happen with hair loss. But I think there'll be a lot more to the story. So maybe we'll stop there and, and see how uh, Rafa and Zavin can build on that. Uh, do you want Chef Kirtan to go, to go over or me to discuss? Well, we can get some more information and then have you guys jump on. Okay. Sure. So for the next helicord, we have past medical history. So the patient had COVID diagnosis in the month of April. So today, I mean, currently we are in the September. So in the April, she had COVID. She was admitted for that and she actually required oxygen and even steroids for seven days, she didn't require tocilizumab or remdesivir. As for the medication, she was prescribed statins for elevated cholesterol two years back, and she took it for a month, and then it was stopped by physician as the lipid levels normalized. Currently, she is not on statins. So just to clarify, she took statins two years back only for one month, and then after that, she is on no other medications. As for the family history, it is not significant. Social history, the patient denies alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drug use. There are no allergies. As for the physical examination part, uh, the vitals are fairly normal, temperature of 37, heart rate of 78 beats per minute, blood pressure of 118 over 78. The patient is saturating at 99% on room air, and the respiratory rate is 15 breaths per minute. As for the general examination, she appeared well and it was in good spirits. But the only thing that was very striking was that there was diffuse tenderness in the muscles, classically in the extremities. But on examination, no discrete tender points were found, which we classically see in fibromyalgia. And in fact, we are also worried about it. So we actually conducted our physical examination from that point of view, but we couldn't elicit the classic tender points in the back region and the neck region. There was just diffuse tenderness in all the muscles. As for the head and neck examination, everything is fine. No pillar, no jaundice. Abdominal examination, respiratory examination is all right. And even in the extremity of skin examination, there is no evidence of any rash or edema, no evidence of synovitis or joint tenderness, and no evidence of any erythematous patches or plaques. And that's the end of helicot number third. Do you have any clarifications, Zevan or Steph? Okay, such a difficult case to deal with, <laughs> as I was uh, with respect from Kirtons. So, from my point of view, this is also a 56 year old woman with diffuse aching pain. So, I was thinking that since this patient feels much better after she rests, I was not inclined to think about inflammatory disease because we could expect that those patients to uh, be in the, in the worst moment in the morning and then after they start doing their activities, they feel pretty much better. For example, when we see in rheumatoid arthritis. So I was not, ex um, I was more, not so inclined to think about inflammatory disease. But then I thought about more of mechanical disease or maybe, um, this is very tricky for me because I've never faced such uh, a complaint. So I was thinking, for example, maybe this patient had a viral infection, in this case, COVID. So I don't know if it's common, but maybe it could be like a post-COVID myositis. I know I don't know if that happens very frequently or not. Also, I was also thinking about polymyositis, and then I saw the kitchen denies any skin rashes. So um, we could, I guess, rule out dermatomyositis myositis in, the, in that case. Um, so when I always also think about diffuse aching pain, maybe there is something that activating the nociceptors very much, you know, like the receptors for pain. So I was thinking, what could be leading to that? And there's a term for that, but I don't know in English. I think it's called allogenia, but I'm not sure. Like pa patients have, with even the touch, they have pain, you know? So maybe post-trauma, some very lost here. Maybe you could help me, Savin, please. <laughs> 
I don't know how much I can help you, Rafael. I think, yeah, it's a very, it's a very challenging case right now with like mostly pretty, pretty non-specific findings, right? That don't, um, don't narrow us too much. There's a couple of um, loose ends to try to potentially overlap. Um, uh, you know, the, the recent history of the COVID illness and hospitalization obviously is very notable. Anytime there's something like that, you know, you always want to kind of assume that it's related as opposed to coincidence, right, as a starting point. Um, you know, these post-viral um, syndromes, like, aren't unique to, to COVID. Um, I think for 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 a long time, we've we've seen patients who experience infectious acute infectious illness, whether that's a viral syndrome or you know Lyme disease, or uh, and then it seems like the infection has resolved by all kind of objective parameters, but um, either the symptoms um, of unwellness uh, during the um, felt during the acute infection never quite go away. Or, you know, with some stuttering course, there's just this feeling from the patients um, that, that they never really got back to normal ever, or ever since then, you know, they began to have uh, some of these really nonspecific symptoms, be those, you know, fatigue, cognitive abnormalities, you know, aches and pains, um, mood changes, things like that. And I don't understand these phenomena very well. I don't think anybody understands them perfectly well. Um, but I, I, I do think what we call like long COVID is a pretty um, broad and not necessarily completely new entity of just like persistent um, sort of post-infectious um, symptoms that a lot of patients uh, uh, develop. Or it could be coincidence. Um, and this is just a new presentation of some, some other illness. Um, I think the, the, the Kirsten clarified in the chat that there's no weakness, strength is full, right? Um, but there's muscle tenderness and we're assuming that it's actually muscle tenderness just because that's what we were told, but, um, and that may be the case, but, but I like Raphael's sort of uh, potential framing and representation of this as potentially allodynia, which isn't necessarily muscular tenderness. It's more like, you know, it's skin, it's skin tenderness in response to, um, you know, a st sensory stimuli, which normally would be non-tender. So a simple light touch, a brush, right? Which you would normally feel as a touch or a brush, um, but in this abnormal state, it is experienced as pain. And that has, um, uh, I'm sure it's own differential that, that I'm not super well versed in, but uh, but certainly sort of neuropathic processes, sort of what we think of as neuropathic processes, whether that's like zoster, right? Like when the skin hurts in zoster, that's allodynia essentially. Um, but it's, it should be dermatomal, right? Or patchy sort of multidermatomal, but not completely diffuse in that setting. If you have a diffuse sort of small fiber peripheral neuropathy, you know, that can cause um, a tenderness of the skin like this. The distribution you would expect to be more initially length dependent, right? First on the toes, the feet, then maybe over the shins, then starting to feel, you know, in the fingertips um, and, and progressing in that way. If this is a sort of a long fiber uh, length dependent peripheral neuropathy. Um, so that's not really matching. You know, the one time that as a, as a hospital medicine doctor that I frequently hear patients tell me that it hurts all over and it literally does feel like diffuse, like allodynia. Um, I see that most in patients with, with acute bacterial infections, um, like with pyelonephritis who end up, you know, being bacteremic with a gram negative rod. I've seen that many, many times. And, um, and I'm always struck at how that happens. And then, you know, it, it, it resolves with, with treatment of the infection. This is obviously a different sort of context and a different time course, but but the point I want to make is that, again, overall, it's just th this type of sort of diffuse tenderness uh, and pain is experienced probably in the breadth of pathophysiologic states. And for that reason, at least, um, again, it may be a knowledge gap, but to me, doesn't help narrow, you know, too much. Now, if we say that this isn't skin, 
but muscle, right? With like deeper uh, palpation. Um, uh, and that, then, you know, you, 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 can, you can potentially try to narrow more on a myopathic process. Then the question becomes how, you know, what kind of myopathic processes cause a lot of tenderness, but not weakness. So for example, most of the inflammatory myopathies um, tend to cause a little bit more weakness than pain. You can also have myalgias, you can also have tenderness, um, but, but the prominent thing is more proximal muscle weakness, which we're not seeing here before. I think it's still as good a problem representation, as good of a frame as we can, I can come up with at least to think of this as potentially a, uh, you know, a muscle disorder and certainly some of the, you know, things um, to check out in terms of markers of muscle injury, CK, aldolase, et cetera, are really important. Um, and if not, then you go to, to, to a to slightly different sort of frame of just myalgias, which again, just become a lot less specific if, if that's what these are. Um, you know, can we connect this with the hair loss? Yeah, maybe. So this could actually be, you know, like, um, uh, connective tissue disease, mixed connective tissue disease with, um, with inflammatory myositis and some other elements of, you know, what you think of as part of a sort of a lupus syndrome um, that we may, maybe haven't seen yet as much of. The one thing I wanted to clarify with um, the timing with exertion is arthritis that is inflammatory oftentimes is worse. It's stiff after a period of rest and then warms up when you exert yourself. But if the inflammatory disorder is just systemic or you're talking about inflammatory myositis, uh, I don't know necessarily that that would get better with exertion. In fact, you might, if it's a muscle disorder, I wouldn't be surprised if you feel, um, feel more af after exertion. And certainly if the systemic inflammation is just causing just like fatigue and, you know, like tiredness and stuff, um, then I would expect that to kind of accumulate with more and more exertion potentially. So so I think um, pretty much everything that's been mentioned is, is, is on the differential. Uh, where would I go from here? Um, uh, yeah, I think the, the general labs as well as um, sort of muscle specific and inflammatory specific labs um, uh, would be a good start. Um, and then, you know, potentially thinking about kind of closer neurologic evaluation um, to, to discern whether there's an element of neuropathy, myopathy, or both. And, um, and by examination, I mean like both on physical and potentially with, you know, um, electro, electromyographic testing. Uh, sorry, Rafael, go ahead. Uh, what do you think about statin induced myopathy since this patient had this on her past medical history? Yeah, I think that would be very rare. Um, I think it can, you know, uh, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy can be triggered by statins and then be a sort of self-perpetuating uh, autonomous kind of uh, syndrome even after the statins have been discontinued. But if you just think about the, uh, the base rate of like that entity among the billions of statin users and you consider the fact that this, this patient was only exposed for a month, two years ago, I think the probability of that is much lower than some of these other completely unrelated uh, diagnoses we're considering, but I think it's possible. Uh, just one more comment. Uh, if this was not to fuse, like it was only limited to the lower limbs, I would actually think about peripheral artery disease since this, since this patient has high cholesterol, you know, but we don't see that in peripheral, like, like in the whole body, you know. That's a great point. And the exertional component additionally, right, makes you, that's a great point, Rafael. That's all I got. What, um, what else are we missing here? Um, Can I ask uh, one question, Kirtan, on exam? I'm, I'm still thinking about how the hair loss fits in. Was that evident um, on exam at all? So on exam, we can't see the discrete patches or any so, you know, inflammation kind of thing in the hair as you classically seen in discoid lupus. But as per the patient, whenever she, you know, combs her hair since last two or three months, then normally there will be like, you know, two or three strands of hair. But since last two or three months, there are like 10 strands of hair. Sometimes, you know, a whole bunch of hair is coming out and it is painless. You know, there is no pain, no inflammation, no itching, pruritus, nothing there. So we couldn't discreetly see it in on the exam, but just from her description, we could make it out that, yeah, it could have been, you know, more hair there in that region, but maybe scarcity of hair is there in that region. 
That's interesting. That's just helpful because um, I don't, I do not have a robust approach to hair loss, but I, I just was thinking about, you know, certainly if there was patchy areas of alopecia, right, that might make you think of a, either a primary dermatologic or a, a known syndrome, right? Like we talked about discoid lupus already where the patchiness happens versus a systemic condition, which I really think is what we're all thinking about now where, um, you know, the, the hair um, often, you know, it, it kind of arrests at the same stage of development and it just happens to come out even in a normal physiologic state in a postpartum patients um, during pregnancy, right? The hair sort of stays in, it has this robust stage and then uh, what's called telogen effluvium happens afterwards where all at once the hair just starts coming out because it's, at, it's sort of synced up more than usual in that final phase of kind of hair's life cycle. Um, so it seems like in this case, right, it's not something focal that's necessarily due to skin inflammation, but whatever is driving her underlying symptoms fits under. And I think um, in addition to some of the inflammatory conditions we're thinking about, um, just putting on the list um, uh, kind of environmental exposures, it sounds like there wasn't much, but um, I, I was just thinking of, you know, what makes someone really sick, but it's really hard to tell. Some, sometimes conditions like heavy metal poisonings um, can make people feel terrible, right? Make their hair fall out. And yet it's very difficult to sort of localize. So we can think broadly as we get more uh, laboratory data on that. Sure. So actually we were also thinking what you were thinking. So our thoughts were very much aligned with yours at this stage. So to give you CBC, the patient's hemoglobin was 12 grams per deciliter. The MCV was 84. The WBC was 7,000 cells with normal differential, so like 85% polymorphs. Platelets were 225,000. Electrolytes, including sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, were within the normal range. The LFTs and RFTs, so AST, ALT, total bilirubin, albumin, BUN, creatinine, all were within the normal range. We checked for the hypothyroidism because given the hair loss and as Stephanie and everyone alluded to, that we have to think about systemic process but the TSS, T3, and T4 were within the normal range. We were also worried about the polymyalgia, rheumatica, and you know, overlap with giant cell arthritis kind of thing, as Valeria alluded to in the first heliport. So we ordered the ESR. The ESR was within the normal range. And all through this period, patient has never put enough flex. As for the creatine kinase levels, we are also worried about that what if this is, you know, inclusion, body myositis, dermatomyositis, or as Zavin and uh, Rafa discussed, that immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. So things like anti HMG CoA R myopathy and anti SRP myopathy. So that's why we checked the creatine kinase levels and they were normal on three distinct occasions. So we checked it, checked it, and it was normal all the time. We even checked the urine analysis to see whether if you know some rhabdomyolysis is going on and maybe the urine will give us clue. But the urine analysis was also normal. There was no evidence of any cast or protein or blood. Specific gravity was also fine. And I guess that's the end of helicot 4. Okay, so um, I think this is really helpful uh, to rule out some of the things. Did everyone lose Valer or was it just me? I believe pretty much. Oh, sorry, I froze. We can sorry, hear you now. Okay. Okay, sorry for that. Um, I was thinking that, well, the, I think these findings make um, some of our differential diagnosis less likely. Um, like the fact that the thyroid hormones are normal makes hypothyroidism less likely. And also the normal is yes, ESR, sorry. Um, the possibility of something like an inflammatory myositis or um, a, a, another systemic inflammatory disease as well. I think it doesn't rule out um, what Rafa mentioned, the possibility of, uh, for example, an steroid use um, myopathy, because I think ESR is normal in that, in that case, but I don't know exactly the time course for the use of the steroids. Um, then the CK, I think, also makes this like the, the fact that the statins could be causing um, the pain. But I mean, a normal ESR, maybe fibromyalgia could could be um, greater in our differential because there is, is normal. But then again, I don't, I mean, and the AST, ALT, and I don't know if Kirtan mentioned that the bilirubin was also normal because I think that also some 
cholestatic pattern could, could present with fatigue. Um, I'm not sure if, if pain, but definitely pruritus could be a manifestation of the patient doesn't have it. Um, and I think the fact that also the, there's no anemia or pancytopenia is a criteria that we were looking for in lupus. And so that's a point against it, I, I guess, but doesn't rule it out definitely. I think um, I will be looking for that natimmune panel and also the bilirubin if it's not yet uh, considered. And, and I think, um, I don't really know how to approach the alopecia in this case, because I think, I mean, I only can think of autoimmune etiologies beyond uh, lupus and, and, and well, thyroid etiologies as well, and maybe some infectious diseases that also present as alopecia, like syphilis, but I, I'm definitely not thinking about it, about that uh, in this presentation. Yeah, it's this case was complex and the complexity goes up with normal labs, right? We're, we're not given um, a clear signal here, but I, I think you're bringing up an important concept, Valeria, which is, can you still have a myopathy with a normal CK? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, you mentioned already that um, the, the statin mediated immune uh, myopathies can have a normal CK. Um, there are situations where uh, with polymyositis, some of the auto-inflammatory myopathies, the CK can be normal. Um, and by the way, this is even in the absence of right profound muscle wasting. Certainly if someone has atrophy for whatever their longstanding muscle destructive process is, just the breakdown and loss of muscle over time makes their ability to elevate a CK even less. Um, but uh, myopathy can still be on the table in the auto-inflammatory category, as you mentioned, the statin-mediated inflammation uh, with certain vasculitides like ankyovasculitis, you can have muscle involvement with a normal CK. And then correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but um, classically steroid-induced myopathy is sort of the weakness without CK elevation. Now, um, I hope her steroids were stopped after her COVID illness, but this is just a point where we can go back and say, make sure there's still not, you know, anything in terms of medications in the background that could be attributing to this. Um, so, you know, I think with the kind of muscle tenderness there, again, there's no frank weakness. I think we can still worry about sort of muscle conditions there. Um, specifically, and um, it really makes me wonder about more sort of specific testing kind of with tissue, as well as um, Zavin mentioned some of the other serum markers that can look for al um, uh, muscle breakdown, such as aldolase, et cetera, could be potentially useful, um, as well as sort of broadening our serology tests for auto-inflammatory conditions that could just be playing into this woman feeling systemically unwell. So ANA um, as a first step for sort of screening for autoimmune conditions, um, ANCA, for example, the aldolase, um, really starting to dig a bit deeper, even with the abnormal labs. And again, returning to her drug history, um, as I mentioned before. Zavin or Rafa, anything else you want to jump in at this point with the normal labs? Or I guess what uh, maybe we can just see is anything else on your guys wish list? Um, if you were to see this patient with these results so far? Uh, I just wanted to add that if you were thinking about polymyositis, it's, it's really important that we go after a neoplasia here because most um, because this could be associated with a neo, uh, neuroplastic syndrome, you know. Great point. Um, I, I something that I saw. I'm trying to find who it was in the chat, but it popped up for a second that I thought was such a good point. Um, oy, uh, it was about the. Uh, asking about just sort of mood um, and wondering how this patient has been uh, feeling in terms of just, you know, depression, depression, anxiety, other symptoms that can be related. And um, it is, it, it never stops to amaze me um, and impress me just how much the, the mind as we think of it and um, the body are related and how much uh, psychiatry, psychology, neurology um, are not really distinct, um, you know, uh, fields. Um, so, so depression can cause diffuse pain and fatigue and a lot of these other things, because the truth is at this point, like, we don't have really anything else. The hair loss is 
very nonspecific the way that it is described and could just be from, you know, either um, psychological, physiologic stress NOS. And we, we have like nothing else. We just have like, right, pain and tenderness, um, but uh, not injury or, yeah. So uh, I, I think that's a really important kind of thing to keep in mind. And I also want to just check our clinical problem solving bias right now and check my own um, <laughs> inpatient medicine bias right now. Um, because um, as that person was saying, I'm sorry, I still haven't found you, um, but it, it sounded like it's somebody who practices a lot of outpatient medicine, like stuff is very common and Rambla. Oh, it, yeah, it was me. <laughs> hey, Hi. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I love your points. And the other statistic that I heard once that that I, I always like like to keep in mind is that in the outpatient setting, in a primary care setting, 80% of new symptoms have resolved by six months. 80% of new symptoms of all symptoms resolved by six months. And um, that's to say, obviously, you're not, you, we shouldn't just like neglect the new symptoms and wait for six months for them to go away before we, you know, think critically about them. But um, okay, that's, that, that, that's all I got. The only other thing I noticed is that like that hemoglobin, it just like stood out as maybe normal, but maybe not completely normal. And if we do have sort of a mild micro to normocytic anemia and this invocation of possible neuropathy, just heavy metals just kind of popped into my head. Um, uh, but yeah. I was wondering if I can add something. Please. All right, this, okay, great. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Zavin mentioned that um, from the ambulatory setting, like here in our clinic, I mean, and I think most of you know, uh, usually even the patient while they're being groomed, you know, we do go, we ask them about mood, which is very helpful, especially, you know, before the provider comes in, you have that context to see how is their mood. Um, and I don't know if I missed this when the case began, Kirtan, was this an outpatient setting or was this an inpatient setting? Yes, so this was an outpatient setting. Yeah, so I mean, maybe for me, I'm a little biased. I always try to make sure, okay, how is the mood of the patient before I start ordering a whole list of labs kind of thing? That's such an important point. Thank you, Ramla. I guess I'm curious from Ramla or, or the rest of the group then, um, would you do anything else diagnostically now or provide some reassurance and just book some follow-up to see how the patient does um, with a little more time? Yeah, that's that's really an excellent question. I mean, I think I would need to see the patient in front of me and to see, okay, how much is this really disturbing you? What have you tried in your life? Um, some sort of lifestyle changes. How's your diet? How's your exercise? You know, especially if you've done your labs and nothing is really popping up. Um, this is a patient who I would definitely want like a close follow-up, possibly like every two weeks. Let me check up on you. Let me see how you're doing. Um, especially if labs do not show me anything or imaging. And then, um, you know, these are patients where you have to tread lightly as well, because you don't want to make them feel like, oh, you're judging me. You think it's all up in my head. But, you know, I try to tell them, you know, um, we're going to try to figure this out together. Let me have a close follow up with you so that we can see how you're, you know, kind of recovering. Um, I think I would even offer some physical therapy, to be honest, because sometimes exercise can be helpful um, just to deal with the fatigue and weakness. Um, I don't want patients to feel like, oh, there has to be a medicine for this, but sometimes simple physical therapy can hopefully be helpful uh, to deal with the fatigue. Um, and then I would also encourage them to have a journal, you know, create a journal and document when are you most tired? What are you doing when you're tired? What do you notice worsens it? Things like that. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you, Pamela. Great, great therapeutic approach. Thank you. Kirtan, do you want to um, tell us what happened next? Sure. So now we have last telecord. So we are also worried about possible neuropathy. So we ordered the EMG and NCS. So both of them returned back normal. But at this point in time, if you think about, you know, why I titled it as hidden in plain sight. So there is one another test, which, you know, I was suspicious about. So I talked to my residents, I talked to my attendings, and we thought that, okay, it is worth testing for. And I would give you that test. So that test was PTH levels. So the parathyroid hormone levels were very high. So at least five times the upper limit of normal. 
So now that's the end of the record. So based on that, can you tell me what would be the final diagnostic test that we ordered and which sealed the diagnosis? I can't so, remember. Yeah, Rafa, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's me. So I would basically be concerned about primary hyperparathyroidism based on these labs. And this could explain because which leads to uh, osteoclast activation that it could explain like the diffuse uh, ache this patient is having probably due to bone pain, you know. So I would like an image of the parathyroid glands to see what's going on over there. Anything else, uh, Stephanie and Zevin, you want to share? Zevin, you want to hop in? Uh, I'm just wondering, did we was did we miss a calcium level? That's the I guess the it was normal. Yeah, so calcium and phosphorus were normal. Were normal. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess looking for a source of the elevated PTH. Um, with a with a scan to see if it's diffuse or a single adenoma. I mean, if that's if that's um, and then uh, now that I hear it, it sort of makes sense. But I would you know I would want to sort of do do some practice based um, learning and and find out more like what how to interpret the the elevated PTH with normal calcium, but this symptomatic for two months and whether it could all be um, related. Um, and whether that is potentially enough to, um, you know, to, to treat the parathyroid um, hyperactivity and see if the symptoms improve. Um, can't, can't wait to learn from this case. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So high, high, high parathyroid, normal calcium. Um, I guess the one other thing to consider would be um, if, if profound vitamin D deficiency can lead to this. Um, I'm not certain about that, but I think trying to, you know, maybe unto itself that this is its own entity, but just thinking about, does it meet, is it, you know, she's hyper parathyroid, but missing something else to not make her then hypercalcemic. Uh, but I'm excited to learn from you, um, Kirtan, about how this all links together. Yes, actually you guys got it at just at the last moment. So actually it was vitamin D deficiency, you know? So we ordered the alkaline phosphatase level. So they were also high. And if you think about the feedback mechanisms and we know that vitamin D along with calcium, both of them kind of, you know, feedback inhibits the secretion of PTH. So when the level of vitamin D are low, the PTH is bound to go up. And in many cases of vitamin D, like at least 50 to 60% cases of vitamin D, the calcium and phosphorus are normal because of this very reason, because PTH is coming and PTH is doing its role, you know, kind of activating the osteoclast, mobilizing the calcium from the bones. So serum calcium would be normal in many cases of vitamin D, including the phosphorus levels. And the mechanism why I was so pertinent about, you know, hidden in plain sight, because if you think about it, vitamin D can cause myalgias and bone pain in numerous ways. So when we have vitamin D deficiency, you can't adequately mineralize the bone matrix. And when that happens, you know what, uh, they lose the turgidity that bone matrix has. So it kind of, you know, swells up with hydration. And when the bone matrix swells up, it lifts the periosteum. And we know that periosteum is a very pain sensitive structure. It is heavily innervated. So it's the periosteal elevation, which causes the pain. And apart from that, as Zevin alluded to earlier, that what about allodynia and hypersensitivity? What about central sensitization? or peripheral sensitization. So that is also important because if you think about it, vitamin D acts at the level of nucleus. You know, vitamin D has got vitamin D receptors, which kind of heterodimerizes with other receptors. So like retinoic acid receptors and lots of other receptors. And whenever you deal with nuclear receptors, then we are dealing with transition factors. And when we deal with transition factors, we are dealing with certain interleukins, certain proteins. So there have been case studies and reports that how vitamin D levels can alter the levels of nociceptive, you know, kind of substances like substance P, things like that, which can, you know, hypersensitize the nerve and can perpetuate this pain process apart from the periosteal nerve fiber irritation. So that was one of the mechanism. And this case was special because this was my mom, you know, this is my mom's case. So my mom actually got the COVID a few months back. We, you know that we had this pandemic in India and my mom complained of this diffuse pain and everything. 
So we even considered the COVID longer. And in fact, as Javan told us that these two things may not be linked. And in, each, and in the end, it was the correct thing. That the hair loss was due to telogen effluvium kind of thing. And we know that COVID long haul can also cause hair loss. So that was attributed to the COVID long haul part. But I was still worried about this diffuse pain. So that's why, you know, I consulted my residents and I told them that, hey, do you think vitamin D could be a possibility? I mean, due to lockdowns, my mother hasn't been able to go out. And even in diet, you know that uh, sometimes you have to consume certain kind of foods to get vitamin D rich and vitamin D deficient. So I consulted them and they told me, yeah, okay, it's a fair shot. We should test for it. And vitamin D was actually 5 nanogram per ml, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So that's like extremely low. 10 nanogram per deciliter less than that is considered as extremely deficient. So that was the case. And after vitamin D supplementation, my mom actually improved. So like, let's say initially she would say pain was 8 out of 10 on its worst day. And now she would say it's like 3 out of 10 or 2 out of 10. So definitely COVID long haul component is there. We can't take it out. And it's still there. I mean, still sometimes my mother felt short of breath. My mother has myalgias, but definitely it has improved a lot. So it proves that there was a component of vitamin D. And actually you nailed it. You nailed it in the last moment. So thank you so much for discussing. I also learned a lot and have a great day. <laughs> I'm speechless. What a fantastic case and just um, reflection of, right? Many things, having had COVID and the recovery from it, the many effects lockdown has had on people, including lack of sun exposure, change in, in diet, um, really just wonderful, wonderful teaching. And thank you for sharing that, Kirtan. Amazing, uh, amazing case. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirtan and Valeria, Rafael, Steph. Um, I learned a lot from y'all. Uh, Franco, do you want to summarize the learning points? Yes, perfect. Thank you, Kirtan, for, your, for the case. I'm glad that everything went well with, the, with your mom. So thank you for sharing with us. Very humbling. So <clears throat> first we take about one of the teaching points is what makes us move. We have to think about bones, joints, muscle, connective tissue, nerve, and really important, the desire to move. So look for mood stability in the patient. If the patient has some features that can be lead to um, a process that involves the mood, the desire to move. Uh, another teaching point is that does weakness improve over the day, worse in the morning? It can probably that be related to an inflammatory process. Uh, Muscle tenderness have, needs to be discriminated with skin tenderness. Sometimes the real expression of the patient is like uh, allodynia, sort of a neuropathic pain when a normal stimuli that doesn't necessarily need to cause pain, cause it. Uh, weakness plus tenderness always presents of inflammatory myopathy. If there is alopecia present, is this is a focal problem or a systemic one, look for uh, key factors of the alopecia, maybe at login effluvium, or maybe this a lupus, so localized between a focal problem or a systemic one. Myopathies can also have a normal CK stuff that talk to us about that. If there isn't any muscle reserve, if this is a patient with an atrophy, there won't be any high CK to, to spec, so be aware of that. Uh, myopathy can be a perineoplastic syn syndrome, look for pyomyositis. Um, and it is important to acknowledge how much impact does weakness has on the patient day to day. If does the patient, is the weakness so inhabilitating or it is something that can be, the workup can be done in the outpatient setting. And always be aware of nutritional deficiencies. Vitamins are cofactors of many biolog biological processes and we always need to be aware of those. Thank you, Franco. Um, hope everybody has a great day and thanks, thanks again for signing on and participating. Bye everyone.